What a great joy to be together tonight. Thank you for being here, for participating in such a wonderful way as we've worshiped. Thank you to those that join us online and by conference call. We hope that uh, those that are sick are feeling better and uh, your recovery can be very, very swift. Uh, we've had a good day. I had a good meeting uh, this afternoon, even preceding that. We're proud of Avery. Uh, she obeyed the gospel. And many of us got to witness that happy occasion of her baptism this afternoon. So go up and give her a hug if you've not done that uh, before you leave uh, tonight. But uh, we're thankful the Lord is good to us. And even though the storms, uh, they seem to keep coming, uh, we do have a God that even in the storm uh, is protecting us. And uh, we see that even in the Savior's life in action what he did for his followers then and he'll bring us through the storms of this life one way or the other uh, if our faith remains firm and strong in him uh, tonight you see on screen if you can see the screen let me describe it for you very simply if you cannot two words big words that's what the screen says big words I like big words uh, and um, you've probably picked up on that before and as you read the Bible there are big words that you encounter oftentimes these will be uh, the name of a geographical location in the Middle East. And those names are oftentimes uh, challenging to pronounce. Uh, many times these long words, these big words, refer to someone's name, an individual. And we would say maybe they got a big handle stuck on them uh, by their parents. And I guess they did. I'm thankful my entire legal name is only uh, uh, 12 words uh, long or 12 letters long. Sorry, not 12 words. That would be bad. 12 letters, uh, four in each, um, first, middle, and last. Uh, some of you have a first name that's 12 letters in length. So I'm fortunate in that way, but big words. The Bible is filled with them. And I thought it would be good maybe on our second Sunday nights as we're together in this year, 2022, to look at some of those big words. And we'll do that. Uh, you might say, what's the practical benefit of doing that? Well, Maybe none as it relates to how you live day by day in one sense, but in another, I think if you really listen and gain a greater appreciation for the message, for the content, for the actual underlying truth that these words communicate, that'll make you appreciate all the more how great our God is, how immense is His love and what He's done for us, and I hope we can do that tonight. Now, when you think about big words, um, in my mind, I, I go back to this character. Many of you may have encountered her if you've made a Disney World uh, trip. You might have watched uh, the movie that Walt Disney was finally successful in uh, purchasing the rights for and producing by P.L. Traver, uh, Travers. Uh, she wrote uh, the original volume, Mary Poppins. And do you remember uh, the big word that Mary Poppins had you to uh, recall? Uh, Anderson and Adam can actually still spell it because last spring uh, in their theatrical production they had to spell it out on stage as they were going through that production supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Now uh, there is great debate over whether that should be considered a real wor a word or not. Of course Mary Poppins tells uh, the kids that's what you say when you have nothing to say. I guess that's as good as anything when you don't have something to say to actually uh, say that. But uh, they along with some of the others uh, committed that word to memory and probably can sp uh, still spell it with some maybe accompanying hand gestures that they did as they performed uh, on stage. But not that word tonight, but here's the Bible word I want you to look at with me. and You've run across it before. Atonement. Atonement, starting with the letter A. Maybe that's a good place to start in uh, our alphabetical order. I don't know if all of them will follow the alphabet A to Z, but nevertheless, the word atonement. Now, it's a Bible word, and I'll show you that by this slide. It appears 89 times in the New King James Version of Scripture, all in the Old Testament. That's going to be important. In the King James Version, it appears 69 times in the Old Testament, or rather 68, excuse me, with one occurrence in the New. The American Standard Version renders uh, the Hebrew all that uh, uh, by the term, English term atonement, 76 times, all in the Old Testament. In the English Standard Version, a more uh, modern published version, it appears 82 times, all in the Old Testament. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, if it's all in the Old Testament, hey, that, that concerns those people back then. We live in the Christian age. Jesus came, and that has been done away with. And that's true in part, the law and so forth aspects. But I think you'll see as we dig into it, what it really means has a beautiful meaning even still for today. But what does it mean? Now, uh, here's a danger, and just this is one of my pet peeves, if you will, and I know people that do it, you don't mean any ill harm, and maybe you've never been told any different. Uh, but I've even heard preachers do this, and I always cringe maybe when preachers do this. Uh, they talk about a Bible word, if we're talking about atonement, and they'll say, well, the dictionary says, and then they give you a dictionary definition, like here, 
the Webster Dictionary, and that's Miriam Webster, not Wade, or any of his family. The reconciliation of God and humankind through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Now you may say, well, what in the world's wrong with doing that? A dictionary is meant to define words. It is, but it's meant to define English words in the English language. The Bible was not written in English, not a single word of it. The Old Testament in Hebrew, a small section of the book of Daniel, some of Ezekiel in the Aramaic language, the New Testament entirely in Koine Greek. So there is no English um, writing of Scripture in the original autographs, as we call them, the original productions by the inspired authors by the Holy Spirit of God. So if you're using an English dictionary to define a Bible word, you may not get the correct definition. And I think with this word, we have to be careful. And in fact, we may have maybe missed some of the beauty of it that I'll hopefully explain to you uh, tonight. Now, our English word atonement, as it appears in Scripture, uh, comes from the Anglo-Saxon, which was, of course, a precursor to English in its different forms, one mint. And uh, further, if you trace the etymology all the way back to where we think it actually first began and originated, uh, in Latin you see the big word there, adenumentum, which meant to unite. And we think that's where the word, English word atonement had its origin, had its start. Now, what we want to ask, though, is what did it mean when the Bible used the term originally. What did uh, the original authors as well as the original readers of Scripture understand when they read that word or they heard it uh, read in their hearing in the tabernacle or in the temple or uh, just by one of the priests? What did it mean in Hebrew when God used that word in the Old Testament? Well, 47 out of the 89 times that the word appears in the Old Testament, it appears in the book of Leviticus. By and large, uh, you see there well over half uh, of the occurrences of the word appear in the book of Leviticus. Now, Leviticus belongs to that section of Scripture that we call the Pentateuch, also known as the five books of Moses, also known as the Torah, the Hebrew word for law. Genesis, Exodus, and then we run into Leviticus. 12 of those 47 times, so roughly about a quarter of those uh, times when the word atonement appears, it appears in one chapter in the book of Leviticus, and that is Leviticus chapter 16. And so if you want to turn your Bible there, we're going to spend some time there tonight. What did the word mean for them? Uh, as it's often rendered in English as atonement from Hebrew, it's in verb form. And the verb form is kafar, which means to cover or to cover over. Uh, there's actually a noun form that gave birth to the verb form, kipper, that we'll see in just a moment. But the word means to cover over. You say cover over, what do you mean cover over? Uh, the first use of the word in Scripture is in Genesis 6, verse 14. God tells Noah, build the ark. You remember he gave him the dimensions, and uh, it's a certain width, certain length, certain height, and to cover it over with pitch. That's the way uh, some of the older versions render it. Some of the newer versions will say a, a tar, a what may have been like some sort of petroleum-based uh, product that we would think of today like asphalt. We don't know exactly what uh, it was. Mo uh, Noah knew what it was, and so he did, and his sons in building the ark cover it over with this pitch, and that's simply what it means. And you can get the image in your mind to cover over, well, to cover it. Uh, you can think of painting, uh, you can think of sealing your deck, and I guess that's the most comparable thing to what they did with uh, the ark, or you can think about resealing your driveway, maybe to cover over. That's what the word in Hebrew originally meant. Now, you may say, well, that doesn't relate to anything spiritually, does it, or does it? In the spiritual sense, it relates to those instructions and sacrificial procedures given, again, primarily in Leviticus 16, and also repeated in a much more abbreviated form in Leviticus 23. If you'll turn over there, let's just read that very quickly, and that gives you a quick summation of what all uh, chapter 16 is about, and then we'll go back and look at chapter 16, just kind of surveying it at large. But in Leviticus 23, in verse 27, uh, verse 26 tells us, the Lord spoke to Moses. So this is God directing Moses. Moses didn't invent it. He didn't just come up with a wild hair one day and say, hey, why don't we try this? No, this is God speaking to Moses. And God says, also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of, there's our word, atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. You shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement. 
to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does not work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. So that's this day of atonement. It happens, notice the Hebrew calendar says, it's on the 10th day of the seventh month. The Hebrew calendar is based on the moon. It's a lunar calendar. And so it is not the same as our calendar based on the sun. And uh, so they don't match up. You can't say the first Jewish month is this, so that's January corresponding. It doesn't work that way. In fact, the 10th day of the seventh month, which uh, the Hebrew, the Jewish people call that month Tishri, will be this year on October 4th and 5th. You may say 4th and 5th. What does that mean? Well, on, uh, if you'll notice there in verse 32, the ninth day of the month that evening, the Jewish day started not at sunrise, not at midnight, but at sunset. Seems strange for us, but as the sun goes down, they say that the day is ending, that one day and a new day beginning at sunset. And so that's this 4th and 5th day, 2022, on the 10th month, uh, or the 10th day of the 7th month, the Hebrew calendar, October 4th to 5th for us. This is known as the Day of Atonement. You will see it variously rendered, maybe on a calendar, not as the Day of Atonement, but you'll see uh, the actual Hebrew name for this day, Yom Kippur. I'll say more about that in a moment. This Day of Atonement, if you'll go back to Leviticus 16, just to give you this diagram, this will help you kind of understand what we're about to try to further describe. It concerns sacrificial procedure that's going to take place at the tabernacle and later at the temple. And the temple uh, will be based by and large on this same sort of diagram uh, structure here. But uh, they're in the wilderness now in the book of Leviticus. They've traveled out of Egypt, just as we read a moment ago. Uh, had Pharaoh finally let them go. He pursued God delivered them across the Red Sea. You remember they're going toward the promised land. They're in the Sinai Peninsula out in the middle of the desert. They're going to wander sadly for four decades because of their disobedience to God once they got on the doorstep of the promised land the first time. But God gave them instructions and it pertained to their worship and their worship would be centered around this place called the tabernacle, just an oversized tent. Those of you that have visited at PTP in the uh, vast exhibit hall of the Sevierville Event Center, uh, I guess whenever we had it last, they had a replica. They actually had these same dimensions, 75 feet wide, 150 feet long. Uh, they had the curtains set up like you see here depicted there. Uh, within this outer court area, you see there is an altar where burnt offerings were altered. There was a brazen laver, which was just a water holding uh, type of uh, just device where the hands could be washed by the priest. But then interior inside of this tinted curtained off area was the holy place. It was 30 by 15, you see there. And inside it, uh, the priest alone could go. And inside it, there was the candlestick, uh, the Jewish menorah that you see, especially around the Hanukkah season that's just ended. That's kind of what that's based on. Uh, you see the table of showbread, the bread that would be set there as an indication of God's presence. And there were instructions about that. And there was an altar of incense where this incense would be burned. It would be aromatic. It would produce smoke. And then there would be a veil. There would be another curtain that would separate the holy place from what is known as, depending on where you're reading in Scripture, the most holy place or the holy of holies. And it was in there, and I know the print may be hard to see, that there was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. Let me take you to the next slide. We'll maybe flip back and forth. This is about the best we can do artistic rendering of what this uh, particular item, the Ark of the Covenant, would have looked like. It was a wooden box, chest, that uh, was overlaid with gold, as represented here in this picture. And uh, on the top of it, uh, there would be these they're called cherubim, which we think as an angelic creature. Cherub is the singular. Cherubim is the plural. Uh, but as God gave instructions for how these were to be made with fine hammered gold, they would have their wings overspread the top of this chest that was overlaid with gold. And the top of this chest would be what was called the mercy seat. 
And that will be very significant in a moment as I'll try to explain it to you. So this Holy of Holies uh, was the place where this Ark of the Covenant, where this mercy seat, uh, where this wooden chest that represented God's presence with his people, where that would reside. And it would be then in Leviticus 16 that we see instructions about that. Now, I'm not going to read. If you want to do that for your uh, Bible time sometime this week, individually or with your family, you can. But let me just survey it very quickly what's happening here. God told Moses, uh, you will uh, have an opportunity once per year to approach me and to come before the mercy seat to make atonement for you and for the people. What did that involve? Well... As you read in Leviticus 16, uh, God says that uh, you will not come just any time. Look at verse 2. I think you may say this doesn't apply to me at all. It doesn't. But I want you to see kind of the background of what the Old Testament talks about and think about how that makes application to our lives today. God says you shall not come just at any time into the holy place inside the veil, which is before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. You did not come in God's presence just haphazardly. Certain areas were off limits. There were procedures that had to be followed. God's presence had to be reverenced. Now, we're going to talk when the lesson ends how that's different today. But I want you at least at this point to grasp the idea that sometimes maybe we're a bit too flippant. In the sense of uh, we do not take seriously what it means to be in God's presence and worship as we are even at this moment. Aaron will come into the holy place. With the blood of a young bull as a sin offering. If you go back, remember here's uh, that altar of incense uh, that's in this holy place. He's made that burnt offering outside. Now he's coming in to this holy place. He's going to offer a sin offering. Uh, that was just an offering that God had prescribed. And this ram as a burnt offering would be given to show that he was aware of his sins. And he was asking God to accept that sacrifice for sin in place of his own death. He will put, verse 4, certain clothing on, a linen tunic, linen trousers, a linen sash. People today say, well, it don't matter how you dress when you go to church. There's some truth to that. God isn't concerned necessarily with the outside. There's no prescription that says to be pleasing to God today, you have to wear a suit and tie. I realize all of that. But again, a, ba a back story, a, an Old Testament understanding is uh, they were very serious. Uh, you gave what was best to God, whatever that best might be for you. And I know that differs maybe from culture to cur culture and person to person uh, in some instances. But uh, here Aaron would come. He's the high priest. He would wash his body in water. He would wear these certain clothes. He would take uh, then and he would make this sin offering for himself and for his house. That is for the other priest. And he would do that first before he could even come into God's presence at all. Now, he's done that. Now, here's where this really uh, becomes quite intriguing. Notice verse 5 says, He will take from the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering, a ram as a burnt offering. Verse 7, Take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. He'll cast lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Now, this scapegoat, your version may say, Azazel. Uh, there was a Jewish demonic tradition that grew up in the intertestamental period that said this was the devil. One, uh, God gets one, the devil gets the other. That's not what Moses is talking about. If you're curious or concerned about that, I can talk to you about it later. It's of no consequence at this point. But Aaron brings the goat on which the Lord's lot fell. How they did this, I don't know. They might have had a rock that on one side they said the Lord's. On the other side, uh, it said the scapegoat. They proverbially flipped a coin, even though it wasn't a flip of a coin, but these two goats were selected. Now notice, the goat in which the lot fell to be the state scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and the lot and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Now, uh, what Moses does uh, is he just, in verse 11, takes kind of a detour then and tells you about that blood offering, about the bull and the goat and so forth. He picks up again in verse number 14 and says, the blood that will be, that goat that is offered as a sin offering, will be sprinkled on this Ark of the Covenant seven times. Verse 15, uh, this uh, goat will be killed as a sin offering, which is before the people. Its blood would be brought inside the veil. And again, as he did with the bull for a sin offering, he would sprinkle it again on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Now, I know if you've got a weak stomach, you don't like the thought of killing little animals, goats, bulls. 
cows, chickens, whatever. You, you just don't like that. But this is what God required of the people. Your weak stomach may not like you to have the idea of taking their blood and putting it here. But this is what God prescribed. Why? Here's the purpose. Verse 16. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them, that is among the people, in the midst of their uncleanness. Other instructions are provided about how they will do that. Uh, skip down, though, to verse 21 for the purposes of uh, time's sake tonight. Actually, verse 20. When he has made an end of atoning, that is, after he's made this sacrifice, after he's taken this blood and sprinkled it, smeared it, as it were, over this mercy seat, he goes back out, he lays both his hands on the head of the live goat. Remember, this is the scapegoat. One goat died, this goat doesn't. Why? He confesses over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgressions, all of their sins, putting them on the head of the goat. This is figurative, of course. And then he sends it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land. He shall release the goat into the wilderness. Two things are happening. One goat pays with his life. His blood is shed, his blood is spread over the top of this Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat. Why is that important? I'll say more about that momentarily, but uh, notice the other goat, this scapegoat. He is given, if you want to say, transferred in a figure. Uh, Aaron places his hand and confesses the sins of the people on this goat, and then he's sent out of the, into the wilderness. And he is taking away... The sins of the people. That's what they are meant to understand by this. Their sins are taken away. Their sins are on that goat. That goat goes out of their sight never to be seen again. Remember, this is a wilderness. They're in the middle of the desert, uh, close to the size of, a t of Texas. They take the goat out there. The goat gets lost. The goat never comes back. They never see it again. The people are meant to understand my sins have been taken away by God, and I'll never see them again. I want you to think about how beautiful that imagery is. I don't know where I first heard it, but I heard preachers sometimes say uh, the sins of the people were rolled forward every year. It's not really the best way to describe this process. It may even be unbiblical uh, the more that I've studied it. But here, this goat is sent into the wilderness never to be seen again. One goat loses his life, paying with his blood for the sins of the people. The other people see, or the people see the other goat with their sins on it led away, never to be confronted again. Now, the people are uh, duty bound here. And we read this in Leviticus 23, but if you'll notice in verses 17 to 31, as we keep reading, the people were to humble themselves. They were to afflict themselves, some versions say. That meant that they would fast. That meant that they would restrain uh, themselves and refrain from any enjoyable activity during this time. They were to remember their sins and the consequences of them and the severity of them. And notice verse 31, it is a Sabbath of solemn rest. They were to do nothing but focus on this idea. Now, to us, this seems totally foreign, outrageous, weird even. But God says, every year you do this. Once each year, you take a day when you do nothing. But remember your sins. You don't even take time to eat, to do anything enjoyable for that 24-hour period. And you remember what it is that your sins are and what it caused. Now, what does this have to do with us today? I mentioned this mercy seat. Go back to Exodus 25, when instructions are first given about this uh, Ark of the Covenant. And you'll read in verse 22 what God says, actually beginning in verse uh, 21. Put the mercy seat on top of the Ark. You see it depicted there. In the Ark you shall put, here's the key idea, the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, that's the angel, angelic wings you see spread out, which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Uh, Moses, here's what you're going to do. You're going to build this chest, and in it you're going to put certain things. Here, the only thing mentioned is the testimony. What's the testimony? It will be what we recall back in chapter 20 when written with the finger of God, the Ten Commandments, the basis, the summation of God's law, a copy of that was put in this chest so that it might be preserved and perpetually remembered. And God says, my will will always be known by what is written inside of that ark. So what's the point? What did the blood of the mercy seat cover? When I sin and I violate God's law, which that's what sin is, among other things, a transgression of God's law, 
that sin makes a separation between me and God because I have stepped outside of His will. I have disobeyed Him. And so there's a barrier because when God sees me, He sees my transgression. What I think the Jews were meant to understand with this word kipper, this word atonement, it meant to cover. It was meant to say that when the blood covered the top of this mercy seat, the top of the Ark of the Covenant, the law was covered by blood. Why did that matter? When God looked down to see sin and the people who were guilty of it, which all of them were just as all of us are, instead of seeing the law and their violation of it, he saw the price that was paid for those sins, the blood of that animal. Now you say, preacher, this is 2022. It doesn't apply uh, today at all. Let me show you how it does as we close. In the New Testament, there is a word for mercy seat. It's called hilasterion. Just a big word in the uh, Greek language. How does it relate to Jesus? Well, in Romans chapter 3, please consider, and this is very brief. We could spend so much more time than we are tonight. But I hope that this will give you a new appreciation for what is described in these verses. Let's back up to verse 23, actually. We know that verse. We don't like it, but we know it's true. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, many people might deny that in society today and say sin no longer exists or it's an invention of a politician or a religious guy to just try to control and intimidate other people. But most people within their heart of hearts and their minds, their conscience, they know God is real and they violated His will for their lives in various forms and fashions. All of sin, Paul makes it clear universally, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely, though, Paul continues by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as, here's another big word, propitiation. That's the word hilasterion. Whom God set forth, we might read it, as a mercy seat by His blood, through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance, listen to this please, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Paul's expecting his readers, the Jews probably grasped, but maybe some of the non-Jews would have had difficulty connecting the dots. He said, but remember the Old Testament when God looked for the blood on the mercy seat so that he could not see the law because it was covered by blood of that animal? Jesus is now that covering. It's his blood that now forgives those sins better than the blood of bulls and goats and animals. That's what the entire book of Hebrews is about. Jesus is now the mercy seat. Verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time His, that is God's righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God is holy and He's righteous. He has to punish sin. He cannot disregard it. He cannot ignore it. Someone had to pay for sin. And the price of sin is death. That was announced to Adam and Eve and when they sinned and even everyone thereafter, that's still the price that's paid. In the Old Testament, God ordained that animals would pay that sacrifice of death with their life. Their blood would be shed. That would be the price paid, but that was insufficient. One that was perfect had to pay that price of death. And Jesus did with His blood. And now Paul says God is still righteous. He's both just and justifier. If I put my faith, my trust in Jesus to be this mercy seat for me by His blood. Let me give you the other two places. It only appears these three times in the New Testament. And it appears the other two occasions in the book of 1 John. 1 John 2, verse 2, John tells us, He Himself, that's of course Jesus, He is our advocate according to verse 1, but He Himself is also, verse 2, the propitiation. He's the mercy seat for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Again, chapter 4, verse 10. John says, this is love. How do I know what love is? He's going to define it for you. Not that we loved God. God doesn't owe me anything. He's not reacting to my love, but I'm reacting to His. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the mercy seat for our sins. Jesus will stand between me and God's law and with His blood cover me, cover my sins. When a Jewish person heard atonement, the day of atonement, a day when I would fast, a day when I would recall my sins, a day when I would see an animal die for what I was guilty of and another animal led away never to be seen again, taking my sins away, all that the Jews could think about was those uh, you know, things that caused that. But it was all imperfect in comparison to Jesus. And now in the New Testament, what we have is that Jesus is the covering for all sin by His blood. 
And it's sufficient not just to cover sin, it's also sufficient to take away that sin. I wish we had time tonight to look at how the Hebrew writer describes this in detail. We do not, but if you go to Hebrews chapter 9, the Hebrew writer will say, You remember what happened? In the Old Testament, you remember the sanctuary, you remember the tabernacle, you remember uh, the Ark of the Covenant, you remember the mercy seat. He said, we can't really now speak in detail. We've had that record, but no one but the high priest was able to go in there once a year. He said, we don't understand that. But the Holy Spirit, verse 8, was indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all, or the most holy place, was not yet made manifest while that first tabernacle was still standing. But Christ, we're skipping over now to verse 11, High priest of good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not of this creation, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood. You want to know what Jesus did? You want to know why he makes a difference in your life? You ought to know, want to know why you ought to love him? Because with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, the Hebrew writer explains it in greater detail than that, but for time's sake, we'll just leave it there this evening. Atonement, it's a big word. But it has big implications. It has big significance to our lives. No, we don't have. I know many of you are probably thinking about Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones didn't find the Ark of the Covenant either. For you movie buffs, we don't have a gold chest. We don't have a priest to do all this pomp and circumstance. We don't have animals uh, killed and blood you know, thrown everywhere. We don't have that. We have something better. We have Jesus who by his death went into the most holy place, the very presence of God, and atoned for my sins. That's what he did. He made my sins covered by his blood. That's why it's so significant when you turn to Romans chapter 6. And Paul talks about what we do now in obedience, in response of faith to what Jesus has done. We are told that we die. You know, that's a strong term for sure. And that probably in the minds of these people echoed what that animal did. But Jesus is here not concerned with our physical death. It's rather, he says, Paul in verse 3, that we are baptized into the death of Christ. What does that matter? We're buried with him through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We have been united together in the likeness of his death. We'll be in the likeness of his resurrection. That is, you see, uh, that I am making a response. I am desiring the blood of Jesus to cover me. How can I do that? Only by identifying with him in his death. Only by dying as he died. He did not have sin to die to, but I must. Buried as he was, not in a grave like he was, but uh, in a watery grave, baptism. And then raised as he was resurrected to live a new life, free because that sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus. Uh, I wish I were more capable, more adequate to describe just how beautiful these things are. I know many of you have studied them, you appreciate them, but by chance tonight, if you've not, I hope this lesson has helped you to just see just in a, a little bit better way how wonderful glorious what Jesus has done for us really truly is atonement it's a big word with a big meaning tonight do you need the atonement that Jesus offers do you need that uh, forgiveness it's available to all who will uh, take advantage of it who will accept it on the terms by which God himself Jesus himself offers it but that decision's up to you whether you will or not uh, he will not force you. He will not uh, make you. Uh, for the Old Testament people, that was a mandate to be a part of the Jewish nation. Really, there was no choice. The penalty for disobedience was their expulsion, was their death. God is not uh, going to be so severe. Uh, the gospel is so wonderful. He expects people to understand uh, the beauty of it and respond in kind and love to the love he has given them first. We hope we can help you do that tonight if you're not a Christian. Uh, as a child of God... Uh, have you appreciated what the Lord has done for you? Uh, you know, I think it's very easy for us, all of us, sometimes to forget. It's easy to get caught up with so much else that's going on in the world in our lives. But what the Lord really did for us, what Jesus really did for us, what he did uh, for me, uh, what great love that is and how I should love him and faithfully serve him in return. Maybe tonight, if as a Christian, you know you're not doing that uh, to the degree that you should in response to his love, then rededicate yourself in his service. Uh, ask for his strength. Uh, ask for forgiveness from those that you might have wronged. Ask for uh, even a blessing from your Christian family to help you in that and support and encourage you in that. We'll be glad to help. Atonement, a big word with a big meaning. If you need tonight to take advantage of what the Lord offers you through it. 
allow us to help you do that while we stand, while we sing together.